All right, I heard the recording in progress note, so we are off. Um, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are to everyone here today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is Incorporating Feminist Practice into Library Research, brought to you by the ACRL University Library Section's Professional Development Committee. We're really de delighted to have all of you and especially our presenters here today. I'm Laura Garapi, I'm a co-chair of the committee and I'll be moderating this program along with my fellow committee member, Anna Sandelli, who will also be helping um, gather up questions that you may bring forward throughout this presentation. Um, just so you know, this is one of many programs that we offer through the ACRL ULS Professional Development Committee. Um, you can see a quick link that I'm dropping right now, slowly, into the chat box with a full list of our programs if you're interested in more. Um, before I introduce our presenters and we get going with the presentation, I do just want to touch base quickly on some logistics. Elois Sharp from ACRL has mentioned a couple of these, but just in case some of you are still coming into the room here, um, the session is being recorded and we'll send a link of the video slides and any other supplemental documentation that might be useful to have um, to everyone who registered for this program, attendees or absentees today. The program will run for an hour total, including time for questions, and you are free to add questions into the chat box throughout the presentation at any time. Anna will be collating those and she'll let you know that she's gotten your question each time. And then when we have breaks for questions um, at the end or throughout uh, based on the presenter's preferences, she'll read those out to our presenters. Uh, Alois mentioned this, but it's very important to make sure everyone can see your question um, when you are Sending your questions in, please make sure you change the chat option to all panelists and attendees. I guess you could say it's a feature, not a bug of Zoom, that it defaults to all panelists. So we want to make sure that everybody who's attending today can see your questions and discussion, unless there's something you'd like to direct just to us. Um, in order to increase accessibility for everyone, we do have Zoom's auto caption feature going during this presentation. At the bottom of the screen, on your Zoom window, you should see an option to adjust live captions, including hiding them if that's your preference. Um, at the end, we'll post a link to a brief evaluation in the chat box where you can give us some feedback that will also be shared with the presenters on today's presentation. So that was a lot of logistics, enough about that on for what you'd really like to hear. Um, I'd like to just briefly introduce our presenters today and give them time to more fully introduce themselves as they see fit. But uh, thank you again, Kelsey, Hillary, and Patty in advance. Kelsey Cheshire, she, they, is the Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Librarian at Virginia Commonwealth University. Her research interests include critical and feminist pedagogy, information literacy and assessment. Hillary Miller, she, they, is the Scholarly Communications Librarian also at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And her interests include copyright education for artists, and creators, um, global perspectives on publishing and access to information, and community engaged research dissemination. And finally, Patty Sobchek, um, she, her, is the business and public affairs collections librarian, also at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Her research interests include leadership development in academia, libraries and video games, mentoring program development, and community outreach. So without further delay, and with many more thanks, I will hand it over to Kelsey. Are you kicking us off? Shall I hand it to you? All right. Yes, All right. Thank Take you. Away, Kelsey. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's webinar, Incorporating Feminist Practice into Library Research. If you haven't had a chance already, we'd like to know a little bit more about everyone attending today's session. So please go to menti.com and use the code uh, 406331161. I'm going to paste that into the chat one last time. All right, so before we dive in, uh, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. My colleagues and I work at Virginia Commonwealth University, located in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Richmond is the unceded land and ancestral home of the Powhatan people. We are all gathered on sacred and unceded homelands of many different indigenous nations, and we would like to acknowledge those communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Um, this acknowledgement is a small step in beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and decolonization is directly linked to the work that we'll be discussing today. In a similar spirit of truth and equity, 
Uh, we would also like to acknowledge that we are three white librarians and we want to acknowledge our many unearned privileges, which not only shape our ability to present this information, but also we remain indebted to our colleagues and scholars of color who have shaped our understanding of these issues. So we've come up for come up with uh, several goals for this webinar. Number one, we just want to raise consciousness. You might not be aware that it is totally acceptable to assimilate your personal beliefs as a feminist into your research. Even more than being okay, it can be a strong methodological choice to do so. We hope you'll leave feeling more comfortable with that approach. Uh, secondly, we're going to be talking about decision points a lot, places in your research process where you can choose to incorporate feminist ideas. You should be able to take small steps if you'd like at the beginning or the end or even the in-between. Um, and hopefully you'll find ideas regardless of where you work in the library. Uh, and lastly, we hope you enjoy these real world examples we give you. It's all about offering some inspiration for you moving forward in your research. So we'd like to quickly introduce ourselves and share a few folks who have influenced our librarianship and feminist pedagogy. Up first, we have Patty Sobzak. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Patty Sobzak. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm a collections librarian and associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And as a collections librarian, it is very important to me to proactively seek out emerging and underrepresented voices for our library collection. Two of the many feminists who have influenced me are Maya Angelou, who inspired women and African Americans to overcome gender and race discrimination, and writer and activist Alice Walker. Walker is most famous for her book, The Color Purple, but she also, also co-founded Wild Tree Press, a feminist publishing company. Walker's contribution to the feminist movement is vital for her efforts to make sure Black and women's verses are included and heard. Thank you. And my name is Hillary Miller. Uh, I'm the scholarly communications librarian. So I focus on all aspects of how research is published and shared. Um, and it's very important to me to make sure that in that process, um, the all voices are included in scholarly conversation. Um, some of the influences that I wanted to mention today are uh, Adrian Marie Brown, who's a writer and activist um, whose book Emergent Strategy has had a huge impact on me. Um, professionally and personally. Uh, Kim Talbear, who's a Sisseton Wapaton Oyate professor at the University of Alberta, uh, and she specializes in indigenous and racial politics in science, as well as does some tremendous writing on higher education and the academy as a whole. And Hannah McGregor, who's an assistant professor of publishing at Simon Fraser University and also host of the excellent podcast, Secret Feminist Agenda. And my name is Kelsey Cheshire, she, they. I work primarily in reference and instruction. Uh, both of those areas have been greatly influenced by not only feminist thought, but critical theory, queer theory, and so on. Um, I would specifically like to call attention to the work of Bell Hooks, uh, whose book Teaching to Transgress is still insightful after 20 years. Um, next, I'd like to shout out Maria Cardi and her impact on feminism in libraries, including her books Feminist Pedagogy for Library Instruction and the Feminist Desk Reference. Um, Sarah Ahmed will also be discussed more in detail later, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention her current research on complaint as feminist pedagogy. Uh, so let's get started. So what exactly is feminist research practice? Is it research done by feminists, research that focuses on the experiences of women, or is it research that investigates the influence of gender on whatever topic is being studied? Uh, instead of focusing on who is doing the research or who or what is being researched, we want to encourage you to think about how the research is being conducted. Feminist research practice is informed by a number of concepts from feminist ethics and theory, and these concepts can be applied to research practices in any combination to produce research that is feminist. So today we're going to introduce some of those concepts and give examples of how they can be put into practice. So while we were planning this presentation, we found a great example. 
a group of therapists, Harvey et al., uh, published their approach, Translating Feminist Theory into Practice. And here's that article information. Um, so they set out to ensure that their research project was collaborative, empowering, and transformative for everyone involved. They had to rethink their assumptions about the research process, which led to the creation of five feminist tenets, and I think you'll agree they easily translate to library research. So number one, questioning neutrality, and even though neutrality is not possible, it's something we're still grappling with in librarianship. Uh, number two, researcher as participant. Number three, amplifying voice. Number four, awareness of power. And lastly, number five, research as practice. So let's dive into those individual tenets a bit further. First up, questioning neutrality. So feminist research challenges the notion that it's possible for a researcher to approach their work from a truly neutral, objective viewpoint. Because as the Harvey team puts it, all researchers have biases which invariably shape the entirety of a research project from the development of the research question through the interpretation of the results. As feminist researchers, we can engage in the practice of reflexivity to help us understand the subjectivity of our own viewpoints. So reflexivity is a term used to describe the processes of increasing our self-awareness by identifying our cultural assumptions and biases, and then engaging in an ongoing reflective process to understand how these impact our research. And related to this is the concept of situated knowledge, uh, which was introduced by Donna Haraway, who said that all knowledge is produced by individuals who are situated in a particular place. Um, their particular context, their viewpoint, and their biases influence the knowledge they create. She highlighted how a claim of objectivity and neutrality in research is in many cases a veil for a very specific viewpoint, one that is white, cis, heterosexual, and male. And she stated that by understanding and openly acknowledging our own experience, context, and place within the world, or our situated knowledge, we can individually and collectively achieve greater objectivity than we could if we were to ignore our situatedness. So building on this, feminist researchers know and value that research participants have expert knowledge about their own experiences. We value and trust the expertise of our participants lived experiences. To the number two uh, is researcher as participant. And the concept of positionality is very important to this tenet. So positionality describes the researcher's position in relation to the research context and those who are the subjects of the research. It asks the question, what is my relation to the participant community? Is it insider, outsider, some combination? Positionality uh, applies across all kinds of dimensions. You can be an insider on some dimensions like gender, and an outsider on others like race or class. And the closer you are in position to the community or the individuals who are participating in your research, the more likely it is that you will have shared expectations, intentions, and power equity. Now we have tenant number three, which is amplifying voice. Feminist researchers look beyond privileged male viewpoints to seek out others' knowledges and experiences. And with the caveat that not all library research will necessarily have research participants, we wanted to discuss how you can, you can still amplify marginalized voices. So let's detour from the tenets as a whole to discuss feminist citation practice. I think this is a great, easily doable way to incorporate your beliefs into your research, particularly when you're writing or presenting or even just starting to understand your research area. So we'll start by discussing Sarah Ahmed. Um, she has a book called Living a Feminist Life, and I want to quickly read her introduction to her citation practices rather than summarize them. So Sarah writes, in this book, I adopt a strict citation policy. I do not cite any white men. By white men, I am referring to an institution. My citation policy has given me more room to attend to those feminists who came before me. Citation is feminist memory. Citation is how we acknowledge our debt to those who came before, 
those who helped us find the way when the way was obscured because we deviated from the paths we were told to follow. We cannot conflate the history of ideas with white men, though if doing one leads to the other, then we are being taught where ideas are assumed to originate." End quote. There's so much to unpack there. Um, so many wonderful takeaways, and I hope that you also found that passage inspiring and insightful. Um, I think a fellow librarian, Eliza Elkin, does a great job summarizing the concept. Uh, she said, when we write, we put our voices into conversation with others, but when we cite, we decide who gets to be part of that conversation. So with that in mind, what does feminist citation practice look like? So Carrie and Daniel are both geography scholars. They refer to feminist citation practice as conscientious engagement. The idea that as a scholar, you should examine your sources and almost count who you are citing. Now, that is not to say that we are to quantify diversity. Um, as they point out, there's not much you can know from a name but it does encourage you to learn about the people you are citing and pay closer attention to whose ideas you are carrying forward and what power dynamics you might unintentionally reproduce. So just to summarize, uh, remember how important it is to be concerned uh, about the political nature of citations um, because it's related to compounded and even reproduced by other concerns we have, including microaggressions, hiring practices, and uneven distributions of labor. So really quickly, citations for that section on citation practice. Um, and as mentioned, the slides will be shared afterwards. Back to the tenants. Um, so number four, awareness of power. So we've discussed positionality and how that can affect the power dynamics. Questioning those dynamics is important. Um, feminist researchers seek to remove power imbalances by empowering research participants to be partners in the research process. And later we'll look at a specific example of this through the methodology of feminist participatory action research. All right, last tenet, um, research as practice. Feminist research is done to achieve social justice. Uh, feminist researchers move beyond theory to practice, also known as feminist praxis, or theory in action. Another quick citation slide, and now we'll go to Hillary, who will cover methodology. All right, so now that we have sort of explored what feminist theory is in terms of research practice, um, how do you actually use it? So how do you put it into action? Um, so before I start giving some examples of how feminism can be applied into research methods, um, I wanna emphasize that there is no one way to do this. Um, feminist theory can be incorporated at any stage of the research process, starting with developing your research question and selecting a methodology to the ways that you undertake the research and interpret the results. Um, and feminism can also guide the way that you share your research findings from where and how you formally publish research uh, to the ways that are specifically designed to share your findings back with the participants and the communities that you engage through your research. And one final note before we move on, um, we would like to acknowledge the barriers that feminist researchers can face. Um, so that, you know, if you face any of these, you're not alone. Um, and if you can't overcome them, you are not a bad feminist. Um, you can change slide. Uh, so Jennifer Brayton, Michelle Olivier, and Wendy Robbins make sure to include this point um, in their brief introduction to feminist research. So I'll quote them directly from here. While feminist researchers can strive for the ideal feminist research process, there often exists a large gap between the reality and the ideal goals. And while the desire may be to promote equality in the research process and to enact social change and transformation, many barriers confront feminist researchers from achieving these aims. So some of the forces they mentioned that can impact the choices a researcher makes include the institutions where they're employed, external research funders, organizations or individuals who have a stake in the research process or outcomes, publishers, and sometimes other members of a research team in cases of collaborative research. 
So our first example actually comes from outside of the field of librarianship, but I wanted to include it here um, as a way to encourage all of us to look both within and beyond librarianship to find inspiration for our feminist research practice. Um, I also want to acknowledge it's one of the many, many examples of feminist research practice that comes from a book I used in preparing this webinar and one you might have um, available through your library like I do, which is the Handbook of Feminist Research Theory and Praxis. Um, and it actually looks at feminist research across a wide range of social science disciplines. So it's great for finding these examples from across every type of field, every type of research. So in this example, um, Catherine Quina and a large number of her research collaborators used a feminist process to refine a survey uh, before they actually put it out into the field. So in this process, you use focus groups made up of members of the population you're engaging with in your research in order to gather feedback on drafts of the survey. And uh, taking this step early in the design of your survey um, is gonna be helpful in several ways. We can advance slide. Um, so first, it's going to help you better select the appropriate vocabulary and phrasing. Um, it can also help identify and remove assumptions or bias uh, that you might have made in designing the survey. Um, it will also expand your own situated knowledge about the population that you're engaging with. And focus group members can also identify issues that you might not be aware of, and as a result that you had not addressed at all in the survey or maybe even in the research design. And overall, this is a way for members of the population you're engaging with to participate and have a voice in the research process. So in this specific example, um, Quina and her colleagues um, were studying AIDS-related behaviors and attitudes in 1999. And before they sent out a survey they drafted, they held focus groups with women. Um, specifically, they wanted to work with women who had attained lower levels of formal education. And they asked these women to give feedback on the draft survey and their feedback was critical to helping to improve this survey. Um, the format of it, the content, the readability, but something uh, specific they also found was that the women shared how the survey affected them emotionally when they took it. Um, and as a response, how truthfully they responded when they took it. Um, so the researchers could redesign the survey to be more sensitive to those who they were asking to take it because some of the questions asked for information that was highly private or at times even painful to share. Um, another example uh, is from the field of librarianship comes from health sciences librarianship, and I think it demonstrates um, in a really compelling way the feminist principles of asking new questions, um, especially ones that challenge established ways of thinking um, and existing structures of power. So in her article, Mary Catherine Lockmiller uh, deconstructed this established definition of community health informatics as a single term. Um, we can advance slide. And she did this deconstructing it by taking, taking those three words apart and actually analyzing each of them individually. Um, then she situated libraries within a history of institutional oppression. So looking specifically at how libraries have often perpetuated harmful power structures and including those in place in systems that are related to healthcare. And finally, she envisioned a queer feminist library practice of care, uh, specifically care for structurally disadvantaged communities. And she used gender diverse communities as an example and uh, envisioned this, this framework where a library positions itself as an antagonist to those harmful power structures and acts as a conduit for information so that individual and collective empowerment is possible within these communities. Uh, the next example illustrates a particular qualitative research methodology of constructivist grounded theory, um, which was used by this team of library researchers to explore opportunities and challenges that early career librarians face when they are working to advance into positions of leadership uh, and management. Um, so the researchers used constructivist grounded theory, which supports the open-ended collection and analysis of data. And unlike um, grounded theory, they uh, co-constructed 
theory by taking multiple perspectives into account and the positioning of themselves as researchers and the participants. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, but they, on top of this, they applied feminist theory. So they were looking at relationships between gender, power, existing um, structures that reinforce oppression. Um, and they sent out a survey to a wide uh, variety of library professionals at all career stages. Um, and they wanted to know about you know, what skills and qualities did they think ideal managers and leaders possessed? Um, to what extent did they feel that they possessed the qualities themselves? Um, and the participants who were answering these questions were not just in one career stage or one type of position. Um, they included library professionals at all career stages. So those with an MLIS degree, paraprofessionals, students, um, early career or managers of early career. Um, they also asked about what type of support they had received um, and what challenges that they had faced related to their identities. Um, so in their answers, participants were able to indicate multiple identities to show when those challenges um, were intersectional. So for example, a challenge is related to their gender and race or ethnicity. So here's an example that comes from um, digital humanities and digital scholarship um, and that demonstrates feminist practice, praxis, or again, how theory is put into practice. Um, this group of librarians at the University of Michigan developed a feminist, anti-racist and equity-centered approach um, in the formation of a digital scholarship services pilot. Um, so they focused on three main programs within their, uh, their digital scholarship services of service, model design, digital pedago pedagogy support, and scholarship support. And they proposed um, an experimental approach. So to build these programs in a way that was community-centric and accountable and caring of uh, the individu individuals and communities involved. Um, and I think in a really, um, an another example of um, feminist practice, um, this was a poster and in their poster abstract, um, they demonstrated their conscientious engagement with citation practices by acknowledging the role of uh, the Consentful Tech Project and also Adrienne Marie Brown's book Emergent Strategy in the way that they developed this approach. So the last example of feminist research practice um, included here and was mentioned earlier is participatory action research. So this is where formally trained researchers collaborate with community stakeholders on research that is specifically designed to create knowledge and drive action that's going to help the community they're working with solve its own problems. So what this means is that the community stakeholders are full partners at every step of the research process. Um, participatory action researchers work to correct power imbalances, um, particularly imbalances in how knowledge flows to and from the community whose problems are being researched. Um, and in particular, they work to avoid this all too common occurrence of research that is extractive. So in an extractive process, process researchers can swoop into a community to do research on that community. Um, and they often rely on the unpaid labor of participants who you know, participate in the hope that uh, that will lead to a positive change. Um, however, all too often the research findings are written up and published in academic journals to become part of a scholarly conversation that isn't necessarily accessible to that community. Um, the findings of the research might not be shared back with them at all. And so as a result, the community doesn't see much or any direct benefit from participating in the research. Um, in contrast, participatory action research is done in the community, with the community and for the community. Um, and so you might be thinking, hey, participatory action research sounds pretty feminist already. And you're right, um, feminist, participatory action research just blends you know, this research with all of the core concepts of um, research that have been mentioned earlier today and they're a perfect match. And quickly, here are a couple of slides of the references for uh, this section of research methods. Okay, so next we're gonna talk a little bit about the production of feminist scholarship, uh, next slide. And the examples we're gonna look at, which I 
will tell you they're not the be all end all, but they are three that I felt might be interesting to look at, including slow scholarship, field work, and open access. Next slide. So slow scholarship can be defined as thoughtful and reflective and the product of rumination, a kind of field testing against other ideas. And I was really inspired to investigate slow scholarship from an article that was written by 10 women academics, nine whose discipline is the geographical sciences. And I'll discuss a little bit more about that article later. Next slide. While the label of slow scholarship is relatively new in the lexicon of academia, its foundations can be tied to the work of Ernest Boyer in his seminal report written for the Carnegie Foundation in 1990. In the report, he emphasized the importance of intentional and intellectual thought in the teaching and the teacher as scholar and also as learner and explored how the use of faculty time is rewarded and especially what activities of the professorate are most highly prized. Boyer's work shed light on the need to understand the connections between teaching and research and the struggles experienced by teaching faculty in meeting the accelerated research timeframes of the neoliberal university. Next slide. Inspired by Boyer's work, scholar Kim England built on Boyer's ideas. He posited that feminist and post-structural challenges to the objectivist social science demand greater reflection from the researcher with the aim of producing more inclusive methods sensitive to the power relations in the work. England's work went on to set the standards for the importance and the reality of including personal reflexivity and considering the role of the self in the research journey and recognize that in the reality, the researcher cannot tuck away the personal behind the professional. Next slide. Through the formalization of the slow scholarship movement, Hartman and Durab wrote about slow scholarship as a response to the acceleration of academic work. They discussed in particular the implications of this intensification for pedagogy and framed intellectual freedom as the freedom to think. They provided recognition of these issues that advances the call for the practice of research or self-care that aligns itself with the growing movement for slow scholarship lacking in the current neoliberal university. Next slide. In 2015, 10 women professors, nine in the discipline of geology, co-authored the article I mentioned earlier, entitled For Slow Scholarship, A Feminist Politics of Resistance Through Collective Action in the Neoliberal University. This article was the further the call to integrate the concept of slow scholarship as a much needed process. For these scholars, it is about making the university a place where many people, professors and students from multiple places of privilege or marginalization can collectively and collaboratively thrive. Slow scholarship is really taken from a feminist ethic of care and cultivates collective challenges to the elitist exclusionary practice prevalent in the neoliberal universities. It is about care that directs our attention to the need for responsiveness in relationships, paying attention, listening, responding, and to the cost of losing connections with oneself or with others. Next slide. The authors of the Affirmation article took it a step further and formed the Great Lakes Feminist Geology Collective as one attempt to reflect on the many challenges they seek to change. Their contribution is to cultivate an explicitly feminist and collective model of slow scholarship. Feminist scholarship provides important insights into uneven power relations and the gendered context of university poly, policy and environments. Another way to look at slow scholarship is that it's not just about time, but about structures of power and inequality, and that a feminist mode of slow scholarship works for deep reflexive thought, engages research, finds joy in writing and working on concepts and ideas driven by our passions. Next slide, please. The authors provided 10 suggestions on how to incorporate slow scholarship into daily practice. And of those 10, four stood out for me. The first one is count what others don't. We can recognize the value of collective authorship, mentoring, collaboration, community building, and the activist work and the germination and airing of ideas. Next is take care. A feminist ethics of care is personal, individual, and collective. We must take care of ourselves before we can take care of others, but we must take care of others. Make time to write differently. 
Writing is a fundamental mark we make in the world as academics and should reflect the values inherent in the life of the mind, rigor, engagement, nuance, critique, and making a difference. And lastly, reach for the minimum, i.e. good enough is the new perfect. Reaching for the minimum allows for a focus on quality, not quantity, and acknowledges the need for balance in our lives. And I want to just point out as I was looking through um, figure, you know, doing the research for this presentation, I found a letter that was written by a dean from Harvard, Henry Lewis, entitled Slow Down, and it actually incorporated a lot of these principles, and it was a letter to the students on how to get the most out of being at Harvard and not losing their minds in the process. Next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about field work. And a feminist perspective of field work acknowledges that we, as researchers, do not parachute into the field with empty heads and a few pencils or a tape recorder in our pockets, ready to record the facts. As Stanley and Wise point out, whether we like it or not, researchers remain human beings, complete with all the usual assembly of feelings, failings, and moods. And all of those things influence how we feel and understand what's going on. Our consciousness is always the medium through which research occurs. There's no method or technique of doing research other than with the medium of the researcher. And per Boyle's work, we, the researcher cannot conveniently tuck away the personal behind the professional because field work is personal. Next slide. The, the researcher's positionality and biography directly affect the fieldwork in that fieldwork is a dialogical process which is structured by the researcher and the participants. It means that those who are researched should be treated like people, not as mere minds of information to be exploited by the researcher as a neutral collector of facts. Fieldwork for the researcher as supplicant is predicated upon an unequivocal acceptance that the knowledge of the person being researched, at least regarding the particular questions being asked, is often greater than that of the researcher. A more reflexive and flexible approach to field work allows the researcher to be more open to any challenges to the theoretical position that field work almost always inevitably rises. England argues that the greater reflection on the part of the researcher might produce more inclusive, more flexible, yet philosophically informed methodologies sensitive to the power relations inherent in field work. Next slide, please. Field work has been one, of the, one important side in which feminists have tried to minimize or eliminate power differences between the researcher and the researched. As anthropologist Diane Wolf points out, in field work, there are three contexts in which issues arise. The first is that researcher and the research usually bring different amounts and kinds of social power, class, race, gender, ethnicity, urban or rural backgrounds, et cetera, to the research situation. Second, research processes themselves produce power differences in terms of who defines the research project, who defines what counts as a problematic situation, whose concepts, questions, and hypotheses are the focus of the research, whose theories and methods of producing knowledge are favored, and the relations between the researcher and the research during the interviews, observations, and other data collection processes. And finally, Writing up and representing the research proves a third site conducive to creating and exercising power differences. In spite of feminist heroic attempt to eliminate such power differences, this goal has proved impossible. Though obviously there are better and worse ways for researchers to negotiate relations with their subjects of research. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about open access as a feminist issue. Open access publishing is a model whose goal is to break down barriers to accessing research. This means creating new and sustainable financial publishing models that do not depend on revenue from subscriptions. These new models incorporate feminist issues such as whose labor and whose voices are heard and valued. As Dr. Hannah McGregor noted, noted, as a feminist scholar, I have become increasingly convinced that one of the most accountable things we can do in our work is prioritizing open access. As Hillary mentioned earlier, she's written extensively about this issue in her blog, Serious Secret Feminist Agenda. Next slide. Looking at other scholarly work in open access as a feminist issue, we can point to Kathleen Fitzpatrick's recent book, Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University. 
In the book, she states, Re embracing open access as a values-based approach to scholarly communication does not just serve the goal of undoing scholarship's commercialization or removing it from a market-driven competitive-based economy, but rather is the first step in facilitating public engagement with the knowledge that universities produce. Next slide. And the, the endorsement from Dr. Hannah McGregor on Fitzpatrick work includes, but, we, if, but if we could collectively agree to the fundamental premise that open access is a feminist issue, then our conversations about labor and value and prestige would by necessity shift. Next slide. So I was really moved by these three quotes by Dr. Hannah McGregor regarding this concept of open access as a feminist issue. She notes that responding to the open access movement by clinging to closed off and paywalled forms of scholarly communication is inimical to the public mission of the university. And the public mission of the university is a feminist issue. Also, feminist research ethic means making our research accessible and accountable. Feminist scholars shouldn't be responding to open access by dragging our feet and, re and reluctantly complying to new requirements. And finally, at public universities, we, feminist scholars, should be leading the conversation about what it means to do open, accessible, and accountable research. Next slide. And these next two slides are some references for this part of the presentation. All right, thank you, Patty. Um, so I'm now going to introduce you to feminist data visualization. So let's now take this idea of dissent and apply it to data visualization. I think it can quickly become apparent how important it is that we devise ways that we can talk back to the data we collect or visualize. Um, that we question the facts that may be shown through visualization and even ways that we can present alternative views or realities with our data visualization. So Jason Moore is a data scientist, and he came up with a Hippocratic Oath for data visualization. And I think it's a little bit dramatic sounding, but it is a solid idea for how we approach visualization. So Jason said, I shall not use visualization to intentionally hide or confuse the truth which it is intended to portray. I will respect the great power visualization has in garnering wisdom and misleading the uninformed. I accept this responsibility willfully and without reservation and promise to defend this oath against all enemies, both domestic and foreign. So then to build off this concept of responsible data visualization, it is very easy to see how feminist theory could be applied as well. Uh, two other data scientists, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein have explained how to apply feminist theory to influence the information design process, as well as the visualizations we put out from that process. And they came up with six guiding principles for feminist data visualization. Number one is to rethink binaries. A great example that we're all familiar with is the false binary of male or female, but we can also think about concepts like reason and emotion or subject and object of the study. Uh, this boils down to how can you register responses that do not fit into the categories we provide. Number two, embrace pluralism. Uh, with that, we can think about self-disclosure and moving away from an emphasis on objective presentations, but rather acknowledging multiple truths. Number three is examining power and aspiring to empowerment. So how can we connect back to the communities that we study? How can we distribute power within our teams? Can our visualization empower the end user? Number four, consider context. Really applying the idea that knowledge is situated and applying context to yield more informative visualizations. Number five, legitimize embodiment and affect. This leads to considering really interesting ideas about visualizations, such as could you create a data mural or data sculptures or even use quilts to visualize your data. Uh, and lastly, number six, make your labor visual, visible. As much as we focus on the technical aspect of data collection, also focus on that human element, like who collected the data, who cleaned the data, who has maintained the data. 
this helps with attribution and credit like we discussed earlier. And so I realize this is a lot in the abstract. So let's talk about an example of feminist data visualization now. So this is a screenshot of a website called Native Land Digital. It is a not-for-profit organization that is designed to be an indigenous-led visualization for native territories, languages, and treaties. And as you can see, before you can even view the visualization, you have a disclaimer that not only discusses the ownership of the data, but also acknowledges that is a work in progress. They also increase the likeliness of responsible data use by including a contact page um, for changes or edits, as well as teaching guides that encourage critical thinking about the visualizations themselves. And so here are my references for feminist data visualization. With all this being said, uh, I'm sure there's running themes that stood out to you uh, about feminist research methods. Uh, for me, I think we must acknowledge situated knowledge as playing a key role in how we approach our research. It's beneficial even. Um, not surprising, but power dynamics play an important part in society and therefore feminism and feminist research. This is all about social justice at the end of the day. How can we work to improve our society through our research? And lastly, there are many decision points in which you can choose to incorporate feminist practice into your research. Every bit helps. So we've come to the conclusion of our webinar. And to wrap everything up, um, we hope that this was a helpful introduction to incorporating feminist practice into your research. We wanted to give everyone an opportunity to reflect and share any ideas they may have. Um, if you'll follow the tiny URL, which we will also paste into the chat, um, then you'll be able to share what you're thinking about as well as see everyone else's thoughts. So looking forward to checking that Padlet to see what you'll share out. And finally, last reminder, um, we're all available to discuss this ideas in, more in depth and you can always reach out to us by email. So thank you, everyone. Excellent, thank you all. And Anna, do you want to apprise us of any questions that have come in or kick us off in that discussion portion? Yeah, thank you, Patty and Hillary and Kelsey um, and Laura. Um, I, uh, for those who have just come in, a quick reminder, if you have a question, to please make sure that you are um, changing your setting to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see. Um, and I see one question in the chat so far. This is a question that says, uh, love the succulents. Were they part of your underlying message? Perhaps this is a, for a thorny issue. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could come up with some kind of metaphor. Um, that's a great metaphor I could have come up with, uh, but at the end of the day, I just really like cactus, and so when I decided I have to find like 50 pictures, um, that's what we settled on, but yeah, I, I'm going to sell it better next time I, I explain that choice. Thank you. <laughs> And Anna, I can toss a question out real quick if others are, oh, I don't, I'll ask mine very quickly. I see another one's come in and I don't want to um, take too much space, but I, I really appreciated the, the emphasis on the end at data visualization and a kind of non-binary, non-objectivist approach, more emphasis on feminist practice. And I think inherently you kind of covered some of this question by including that, but what's y'all's take on in an environment where we're so driven by accountability, data, um, you know, budget models that need demonstration of impact, so on and so forth, and more uh, types of scholarship and research, including feminist-based research, that honors other ways of knowing and the types of approaches that that come to the table in that context. Is that something that y'all had a chance to spend time thinking about? Um, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, yes, yes to that. Um, you know, as I really, as I mentioned, I really like that article by those um, female academics that were geologists as well. And 
I love the fact that their effort is really very grassroots. And I think sometimes I think we always need to seek out, you know, collective ways of doing things. I think there's also an individual mandate as part of that. And I think that we just need to be walking the walk and talking the talk. I think that we can serve as examples for that. And then the work that we do, um, I think matters, but I don't think it's going to be this huge, you know, awakening. I think it is unfortunately going to be very evolutionary versus revolutionary. But I think as we raise awareness to these issues, I think we're going to find more people are going to be interested in knowing more and doing more. Excellent. Thank you, Patty. And back over to you, Anna. Thank you. We've had several questions come into the chat and I've made note of those. Um, the first one, Mariana asks, do you know of any best practices for assessing search and discovery tools for biases or any relevant literature? So I think the number one, if you're not already familiar with it, and you may be the number one book that um, could be a good starting point for anyone who wants to know more about bias in, in searching and searching and discovery is called Algorithms of Oppression, um, which is a really fantastic book on, on that subject. And I think it obviously gives a lot for us to think about um, within in libraries. I think some of it talks sort of about, you know, Google and, and algorithms and things like this, but I, I'm not sure, you know, how well we understand the algorithms, not just in something like Google, but in any of the databases, you know, we're, we're directing folks to. Um, yeah, Kelsey, did you want to jump in on, on that one at all or any, anything from, I don't know, teaching about searching? Uh, no, I, I, I don't know of any best practices, um, but I think at the end of the day, you have to bring up these issues so that students and users are aware of, of some of these things they may not realize with the, the tools that we are sharing with them. Um, you know, often we, we want to place them on a pedestal. This is the best place to get all of your articles, to get the, the best uh, grade in your class and all those things, but um, everything's a lot more nuanced there. Uh, oh, and I see also a recommendation for a book called uh, Race After Technology. Yes, I haven't had a chance to read that, but um, it's, it's definitely um, on the to-do list. Great. And I see two questions about um, citations. Uh, the first is, uh, Julie asks, do you see any room for teaching about citational politics and the cite Black woman movement specifically in information literacy instruction? Yeah, so I've actually used um, a, a small portion of some of what we covered today to talk about both feminist citation um, practice as well as the cite Black women movement. Um, just kind of a little morsel in some sociology classes, the senior um, undergraduate upper level courses. Um, and I, I would say the most interesting thing is, is how into it the students are. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't be afraid to kind of introduce it in some of your info lit sessions. Um, they seem to really dig some of these concepts. So thank you for that question. And we also have a question about any suggestions on how to identify the diversity of article authors. Uh, the, the audience member asks, I prefer to offer more than white European male voices, but locating articles can be time consuming. Yeah, so I know there, yeah, trying to figure out sort of like understanding the identities of, of authors. Um, I mean, I think some people, you know, have proposed yes actually going through and kind of understanding the the identities of the people um, who you're citing although that can be difficult um, particularly because some of that information like someone mentioned could be a bit public facing a biography or a picture of them on a website but there are lots of aspects of our identities that aren't necessarily going to be revealed um, through that perspective so i think a more holistic way to think about it is within not just in what article, like the literally checking your articles, but from the start, um, thinking about um, what is the phrasing I've heard that I like is what is B 
beyond the canon um, in my discipline? Um, who who is emerge, new and emerging? You know, is there are there new and emerging scholarly voices? Um, looking beyond databases, obviously, so exploring social media or preprint repositories or places um, where new or emerging research is, is being shared. Um, and yeah, besides just the diversity, I think trying to look a little closer at the, the perspectives that are being offered. You know, one of the examples that I gave, the one for health sciences or medical librarianship, I thought was really wonderful because the author was completely positioning herself and her own perspectives within the research and identifying, you know, the, the like I, parts of her identities. Um, I think that's just tricky because for the most part, we're not, researchers are not very encouraged to show themselves at all. You know what I mean? In, in the article when they publish it. So yeah, it's difficult. I also wanted to jump in on what Hillary said and talk about just building library collections and some of the challenges in that and finding those voices that aren't in the regular places you look. And so the extra work involved and really kind of following and looking at different voices and then really finding out where to locate their materials and really spending more time with small publishers and, and really trying to be more intentional about that and not on automatic and it's it, you have to be disciplined and you have to be prudent and you have to take that extra time but it's worth it and we found some great collection items from that from that process i think we have time for one or two more questions um, and laura also just put in chat for anyone who needs to head out uh, the link to the committee's um, session evaluation Um, I want to just jump in and thank folks who are in, in the Padlet participating to um, both adding comments and responding and offering resources. So this, this is going to stay up. So if folks want to keep adding to it or come back to see if, if anyone has responded, um, it will be here. We'll be there. Yes, and we can certainly make sure um, panelists when we send out the follow up materials that we ensure that links available for folks um, and, and we can touch base on this more too, but to the extent y'all want some of the great recommendations for readings that have come through chat and things like that, if y'all want to add an extra slide, whatever works for you, we'll figure that out. In the spirit of good feminist research practice, there's been a lot of, of knowing and uh, knowledge coming from our audience too. Any last minute questions? It is 2.58 and we do want to make sure we get you out right on time. Or panelists, anything else you want to share with the group? Okay, well, in that case, I will just thank you all again so much, pres presenters, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, as always, have to thank ACRL, who really makes all the magic behind the scenes happen for this, um, especially Elois Sharp, who was our um, kind of shepherd in this entire process for this presentation, but most of our presentations too that our committee does. Um, the recording will be out as soon as we can get it um, organized for you all, probably in the next few days. And please, again, do take a moment to fill out this session evaluation, which I'll drop one more time here in the chat for your convenience. And again, thank you so much for a great conversation and contributing to the discussion to those of you who attended. So with that, I will stop the recording. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.